Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wur Wurundjeri people of the Kalin Nation and pay my respect to the elders past and present and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce today's Wednesday seminar speaker, Robin Schenk, who started a PhD in early 2014. And so I met Robin the first time mid-2013, and it was quite clear from the beginning that she likes things done thorough and efficient. In the first email in which she told me that she would like to join my lab, she straight away mentioned that she would like to apply for an LFA scholarship, and it's not only paying for a salary, but more importantly, she said, it gives you 10K for the lab. <laughs> and that's, I thought, well, that's pretty good start, I thought, and needless to say, Robin managed to obtain to get this scholarship as her writing and communication skills are amongst many of her strengths. However, the real reason why I actually took on Robin in my lab were two things she wrote in her CV, and Robin might remember. First thing was that she played soccer, and I was like, that's, <laughs> that's brilliant because we need a bit of improvement in the soccer players in our Friday soccer team. But the second thing which caught my eyes even more importantly was that she liked to bake and decorate cakes. <laughs> And I thought, wow, exactly what we need in the lab. <laughs> and the latter skills have definitely helped to overcome many negative, but more importantly, celebrate many positive results during Robin's PhD. But in all seriousness, Robin is a fantastic PhD student who has it all. She's intelligent, hardworking, not shy to take on any new challenges, which is also reflected in a track record. Not many PhDs will have published two papers back to back as a first author in a journal in CDD. And have, she has also been named as a co-author on many other publications. Besides her scientific qualities, Robin is a great person to have in the lab, always helpful, confident, not arrogant, just a team player. And without further saying, I hand over to Robin, who will speak about my favorite molecule, the characterization of A1 in vivo. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. That was a really, really nice introduction. Better than I, I was a bit nervous about that, not going to lie. Um, and also, thank you all of you for turning up today. Um, I know on a hot day like this, we'd much rather be out at the pub having some beers. So thank you for delaying that by at least an hour so that I can join you. So most WeHi seminars will begin with a number, something like this. And they'll tell you that this is the number of people affected by some sort of infectious disease or uh, the number of people that die due to a certain type of cancer. What I'm going to tell you today is that this is actually something that happens every day, and it just happens to the cells that are in our bodies. Now, if this was a number to represent the number of people affected by some certain disease, it would be viewed as tragic, if not even horrifying. But the thing I'm going to tell you as well is that it's meant to happen, and it's um, in actually incredibly important for the survival, well, to the health of every individual in this room. So this is because every cell in our body contains a built-in self-destruct program. So these cells are meant to die eventually. And the self-destruct program is called apoptosis. So apoptosis was coined um, by John Kerr and his colleagues in 1970, oop, that point is weird, in 1972. And it comes from Greek uh, to mean falling, as in leaves from a tree. And I really like this analogy because just like trees lose their leaves every autumn, apoptosis is a really normal and natural process. So what does a cell death actually look like? These are some schematic drawings from that original paper back in 1972. And this is a more recent image using a scanning electron microscope that shows what happens as a cell dies via apoptosis. And you can see these characteristic features that include the shrinkage of the cell and the formation of these apoptotic blebs. There's other characteristic features that include condensation of the chromatin and DNA fragmentation um, that basically result in this form of cell death, which is actually quite beautiful. Importantly, it's a really tidy form of cell death. So the cell is neatly destroyed, and then it's picked up by macrophages, and so it's immunologically silent. We know a lot about the molecular control of apoptosis, and broadly, there are two pathways that control it. So apoptosis can be triggered by intracellular stresses or extracellular binding of death ligands to death receptors. And for the first part of my talk, I'm just going to be talking about this intrinsic pathway. 
This intrinsic pathway is regulated by the BCL2 family of proteins, which broadly consists of pro-survival proteins and also pro-apoptotic proteins. And it's roughly the balance between these two groups that will determine whether a cell will live or die. All of these proteins are related to each other by these BH domains, or BCL2 homology domains. So the pro-survival proteins have four of these BH domains, and so do these pro-apoptotic effector proteins, Bax, Bax, and Bock. There's another class of pro-apoptotic proteins that are termed the initiators of apoptosis, and they only have one of these BH domains, and so they're commonly referred to as the BH3-only proteins. How do these proteins all interact with each other? Well, generally, like I said, it's intracellular, apoptosis, uh, intracellular stress that triggers intrinsic apoptosis. So common examples of this are DNA damage or nutrient deprivation. And these alarm signals will upregulate these pro-apoptotic BH3-only proteins. Once these proteins are activated, they induce apoptosis primarily by inhibiting the pro-survival proteins. So the pro-survival proteins that include BCL2, BCLXL, BCLW, MCL1, and A1, their main role is to restrict apoptosis by keeping the leash on things. And they do this by inhibiting the BH3-only proteins, but also inhibiting the pro-apoptotic effector proteins, Bax and Bax. However, when you get upregulation of the BH3-only proteins in response to stress, this tips the balance in favor of apoptosis. So now the BH3-only proteins who do inhibit the pro-survival proteins, do so to such an extent that the pro-survival proteins no longer keep the cell alive. It's important to note as well that some of these BH3-only proteins can also directly induce apoptosis by activation of Bax and Bax. So Bax and Bax, I mentioned before, are the effect of proteins. And once they become activated, it becomes the point of no return because they oligomerize and form pores on the outer mitochondrial membrane that it allows the release of apoptotic factors. And the classic example of this is cytochrome C. The release of these apoptotic factors allows the formation of this protein complex known as the apoptosome. And this is the beginning of what is called the caspase cascade. So these caspases are assisting aspartic proteases that have thousands of different cellular substrates. And their role is to find these substrates, chop them up, and orchestrate this destruction of the cell. It's important to note, again, with these pro-survival proteins, that they're important, their job is to keep the cell alive. And I wanted to mention that although we often talk about how death is induced by this pathway, it's important to also recognize that survival signals will also upregulate pro-survival BCL2 family proteins. And this is really important. So for example, in cytokine signaling events, you often have the BCL2 um, pro-survival proteins at the downstream of these events. And this is important for cell survival in many different instances. So my personal interest is in apoptosis during the immune response. And there's several instances where apoptosis is important in this process. As an example, I've just shown this curve here, which is your typical immune response using CD8 T cell numbers as, um, as they progress during an infection. So before infection, you have very low number of these cells, but in response to a pathogen of some description, you get massive expansion of these cells. And this is where it's really important that these survival signals are working, because if you're mounting an immune response, you need these cells to be active and ready to go to deal with the pathogen at hand, much like you need to feed your soldiers that are going to the front line. In terms of the actual immune response itself, death signals are really important in the actual killing of infected cells. And then at the end of the immune response, death signals are also important for returning these populations back to normal levels. And this is really important because if this doesn't happen properly, oh, sorry, you can get the, um, you can get potential collateral damage in the form of overactive immune cells that are still sticking around and causing mayhem. So I want to focus in a little bit more about these pro-survival BCL2 family proteins, and we've, of which there are five, which I've already mentioned before, BCL2, BCLXL, BCLW, MCL1, and A1. Studies have shown that these pro-survival proteins have different roles in different cell types, and a lot of this has come from studying knockout mice. And again, because my interest is in the immune system, I'm just going to talk today about the important pro-survival proteins in hematopoietic cells. So the first of these mice to be made was the BCL2 knockout mice. Now, these mice are small compared to a wild-type mouse, and this is because of the importance of BCL2 in other cell types. 
Um, but these mice also showed that over time their lymphocytes, so their B and T cells, were dying with age, which highlighted the importance of BCL2 in the survival of mature B and T cells. BCLX knockout mice are embryonic lethal. So at about day E14.5, you can see that the development is severely affected, and this is mostly due to blood and neuronal developmental defects. However, you can study the effect of BCLX in an adult mice using various tricks. So for example, chimeras using hematopoietic BCLX knockout cells and um, also in conditional BCLX knockout mice, we've been able to see that BCLX is really important in developing B and T cells and also in platelet survival. MCO1 knockout mice have the most severe phenotype of any of these knockout mice. In terms of this is about as far as they get. At embryonic day 3.5, which is the blastocyst stage, you can see that there's a dramatic loss of cells and these mice fail to progress any further. But conditional knockout mice have shown a role for MC01 in a whole bunch of different cell types as well. And this is not restricted to the hematopoietic system, but just to highlight that MC01 is important in hematopoietic stem cells, lymphocytes, as well as plasma cells, dendritic cells, neutrophils, and also NK cells. So what about A1? Well, you've already kind of heard from my title that I've studied the A1 knockout mouse. So before my PhD, there was no knockout mouse. But we knew that A1 was interesting in the immune system because we see that A1 is upregulated by antigen or cytokine receptor stimulation events. And it's an NF-kappa B target gene as well. So this schematic just here shows, just in orange, the various different immune cell types that express A1. And this includes cells from the lymphoid lineage on the right-hand side here, so that includes your B cells and your T cells, but also some myeloid cell types, including neutrophils, mast cells, and conventional dendritic cells. So the trouble with A1 and the reason that we didn't have a knockout mouse for such a, real, a long time is because mice have four A1 genes that are a result of gene duplication events. So you have A1A, A1B and A1D, and A1C is a pseudogene because it has an early stop code on that results in a truncated non-functional protein. But in terms of the other isoforms, they're all present in this same chromosomal region, and there are these other really annoying functional genes in between them. So you can't just delete the entire locus. People have tried to generate A1 knockout mice or to study the role of A1 in vivo, and the first of these attempts was to delete just the A1A isoform. And these mice were pretty normal other than they had enhanced neutrophil and mast cell apoptosis in vitro. This suggested that there was redundancy between these different isoforms. More recently, A1 has been knocked down using shRNA targeting technologies, and they reported minor effects in B cells, T cells, and also dendritic cells and mast cells. But there are complications with the system, inefficient expression of the shRNA, inefficient knockdown, and also potential off-target effects from the gene targeting systems being used. Regardless of these complications, a knockdown was never going to be equivalent to a knockout. So this is what we wanted, our lab wanted to achieve. So to generate an A1 knockout mouse, we had to use quite complicated gene targeting strategy, which involved sequential deletion of A1A and A1D, first in embryonic stem cells. And it's important to notice that this is well before the time of CRISPR-Cas9. So using good old-fashioned classical recombination techniques, if any of you can still remember that. Additionally, A1B was flanked by LOX P site, so this allows for the conditional deletion of A1B. So we took these A1B flox mice and we crossed them with Cree transgenic mouse strains. So Cree recombinase is basically an enzyme that will recognize these LOXP sites and cut out the gene that's between them. So by doing this, we generated a complete A1 knockout mouse. So A1 is deleted in every tissue of these mice from um, development onwards. And this is the actual mouse. So um, we were... Uh, we were never sure what was going to happen when we deleted the whole A1 gene. As I mentioned before, BCL2 and BCLX, oh, sorry, BCLX and MCL1 knockout mice are embryonic lethal. So we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but yep, A1 knockout mice are viable and they're also pretty cute too. So that brings me to the aims of my PhD. First of all, what is the consequence of taking this gene out of the mice? And then of course, because A1 is important in, or thought to be important in all these different immune cells, what is the role of A1 in the immune response? So going back to this diagram, 
We knew that A1 was expressed at least by gene expression analyses in all these different cell types. So we decided to analyze each of these different cell types in turn. And so to do that, I took the hematopoietic organs, so that's the spleen, thymus, bone marrow, and lymph nodes, and also peripheral blood. And I analyzed the different immune subsets using flow cytometry. Also, I did in vitro stimulation assays to look at cell survival after these cells are activated. So starting off with the B cell lineage, prior to my PhD, we knew that that A1 was upregulated after B cell receptor stimulation. But this was on the mRNA level. Um, but luckily for us, we generated an A1-specific antibody just around the start of my PhD. So we've been the first people to actually show that this happens at the protein level. So you can see that A1 is not present in B cells at a reasonably appreciable level in the steady state. But once you activate these B cells, they really massively upregulate A1. Importantly, this antibody also lets us or allows us to show that this A1 knockout mouse really is an A1 knockout. There is no A1 protein left. So given this expression of A1 in B cells, we characterize the B cell subsets in the spleen. So you can look at immature and mature B cell subsets by staining for IgM and IgD, with immature cells being single positive for IgM and mature cells being double positive for IgM and IgD. But we could see that there were no differences between wild type and A1 knockout mice for either of these subsets. But more importantly, we wanted to look what happens after activation. So I performed this B cell activation induced death assay. So what you do here is you treat B cells with anti-IgM. And what happens is without any co-stimulation, these cells undergo apoptosis more rapidly than untreated cells. So you can see that by comparing the rate of apoptosis in black, which is untreated, and orange, which is with anti-IgM. You can also appreciate that the wild type in solid lines and A1 knockout in dotted lines are exactly the same as each other. So there appears to be no defect in B cell survival in the A1 knockout mice. So then we moved on to the T cell lineage. So A1 is thought to be expressed in T cell development, but also in mature T cells, like in mature B cells, strongly when um, T cells are activated. So to look at T cell development, we'd look in the thymus, and you look for expression of CD4 and CD8. And briefly, these cells differentiate in a, in, from being double negative, so expressing neither of these co-receptors, to expressing both of them or being double positive, and then committing to becoming either CD4 or CD8 lineage cells. In addition, you can also look at this DN phase in a little bit more detail um, by expression of CD44 and CD25 defining CD, DD, DN1, 2, 3, and 4 phases. So looking at this in the thymus, we couldn't see any differences in the numbers in any of these populations between the wild type and the A1 knockout mice. And it was the same in these DN phases, despite these being the phases that reported A1 expression before. Mature T cell subsets in the spleen as well were also unaffected. So here looking just at CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells. But we did see something interesting when we began looking at um, the effector memory T cell populations. So just to explain, these mice haven't been challenged with any pathogen, but you can still detect a level of T cell activation in naive mice. And we do this by looking at stains for CD62L and CD44. So naive T cells express CD62L, but as they've been activated, they express CD44. And then we further divide these cells into effector memory cells that lose CD62L expression and central memory T C cells that retain it. And interestingly, we saw a reduction both in the proportions and also in the cell numbers of A1 knockout CD4 effector memory and central, central memory T cells, which seemed to fit with the expression of A1 in T cells that have been activated. So then we did the in vitro assay, and disappointingly, we didn't see anything. So in this assay, CD4 T cells have been stimulated with anti-CD3 and anti-CD28, and this induces their proliferation over time, which you can see by the increase in cell number. But there were no differences between the wild type and the A1 knockout in the dotted lines. So then we moved on to the myeloid lineage. So neutrophils are um, a cell type that um, are regular, oh, activated by factors such as LPS, which is a bacterial component, or the cytokine GMCSF. And though A1 is 
not expressed in naive neutrophils, you can see that it becomes strongly expressed once they become activated. And we were particularly interested in neutrophils because of what was previously reported with the A1A knockout mice. So this is looking at the number of, cell, number of neutrophils that are dying over time. Um, and you can see in the dark circles that the A1A knockout mice appear to have enhanced apoptosis. So we can look at neutrophils by staining for MAC1 and GR1, just here. And you can also look for macrophages and monocytes at the same time that are just MAC1 single positive. But we were unable to see any differences in either the spleen or bone marrow in either of these myeloid populations. Mm -hmm. But again, we were more interested in the activation assay. So I stimulated neutrophils with this cytokine GMCSF. So you can see that this induces a strong survival signal, so the cells are now surviving in culture for a much longer time, but there's no survival defect, and also we don't see the same survival defect that they saw in the A1A knockout mice, concluding that neutrophil survival is normal in these mice. So then we moved on to the mast cells, which are also interesting because of the same um, mouse model which reported uh, a defect in mast cell survival after activation. So again, we've shown that A1 is upregulated when mast cells are activated. And in this paper, you can see using a specific type of um, activation, which is IgE cross-linking, the A1, it should say A1A knockout mice, not A1 knockout, um, uh, have poorer survival in an in vitro assay. So to look at mast cells, uh, we look in the peritoneum of these mice staining for FC epsilon receptor and also CKIT. And perhaps not surprisingly, we didn't see any differences here. So then we performed the same cross-linking assay that um, we saw in the A1A knockout mice using FC epsilon receptor cross-linking um, with bone marrow-derived mast cells. So you can see that this induces a small survival bump in the orange lines, but the wild type and A1 knockout lines overlap really nicely. So there's no survival defect here either. Finally, we looked at dendritic cells. Um, so just briefly, there's two broad classes of dendritic cells. You have the plasmacytoid dendritic cells, known as PDCs, and also conventional dendritic cells, or CDCs. And these are cells are pretty interesting because they're the only cell type that we know of that expresses A1 without any activation being required, as you can see here. So we were quite excited to see um, that there was a significant, although small, decrease in the number of CDCs in our mice. But even more excitingly, I gave some cells to Emma Carrington and Yifan Zhan in um, the Lou lab, and they were able to show that CDC survival is severely impaired um, in vitro. So these cells, uh, when you put them into culture, uh, are pretty sensitive to apoptosis anyway. So wild type cells, you only get about 30% back one day later. But with the A1 knockout, you got less than 10% back. So that was good to see that A1 does do something. So the consequence of A1 and the deletion <laughs> in the mouse. A1 might have a role in these memory CD4 T cells, but we weren't able to see any defects in survival after activation in vitro. A1 is, seems to be required for CDC survival, both in vivo and in vitro, so that's something. But overall, these mice are still pretty normal. And um, you can read. If you don't think that negative results are still results, you can read all about it. Uh, <laughs> So, but this led to our next question, which is the role of A1 in immune responses. So I keep going on about how A1 is upregulated in activated immune cells. So it makes sense to actually challenge these mice with something and see if they can deal with it. So for this purpose, we did an influenza infection model. And I just want to take you through the different cell types that we're interested in in this model. So basically, when you have a virus being encountered, um, it's picked up by antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, and they'll process viral peptides and present them by MHC to the CD4 and CD8 T cells. So the CD8 T cells are your cytotoxic T cells. So they're the ones that are going to be out there directly killing virally infected cells. The CD4 T cells are your helper T cells, and these come in two different flavors. We have Th1 cells, which are important for activating the cytotoxic T cells, and also TFH cells, or T follicular helper T cells, which are important for establishing the germinal center. The germinal center is a specific B cell reaction where B cells are multiplying and becoming more and more specific for the, um, the original antigen. And eventually, this allows the production of 
antigen-specific plasma cells that produce antibodies that are specific for the antigen, and also memory B cells, which can be recruited upon a recurrent infection. So to do this experiment, we had to, well, we wanted to do it in mixed bone marrow chimeras, and this is a little bit complicated, so I'll just take you through it. The reason we did this was because the flu infection can vary, vary, vary a lot between different mice infected with the same um, virus. So by doing this, you've basically got a soup of wild-type cells as well as A1 knockout cells responding to the same infection in the same mouse. And we use these different cell surface markers, LI5.1 and LI5.2, to distinguish between these two different types. So in every situation, we have LI5.1 are wild-type bone marrow cells, and LI5.2 are the A1 knockout cells that we also generated LI5.1 wild-type, LI5.2 wild-type controls. So to generate a bone marrow chimera, you need to lethally irradiate a recipient mouse, and then you inject a mixture of wild-type and A1 knockout bone marrow, and that becomes the immune system of that mouse. <laughs> to analyze this, again, you, go, you turn to facts, and you use these cell surface markers, LIF5.1 and LIF5.2. So again, you can compare the competitors with either your wild-type or your A1 knockout cells. And then you can look at any particular population that you're interested in. So this is just an arbitrary example. But you could, would imagine that if there's any disadvantage to the A1 knockout cells, you would see a decrease in whatever population you're looking at. Or in this instance, where there is no disadvantage, these numbers are the same. So this is a pretty mild infection. We give the mice uh, the flu via an intranasal infection, and then after eight days, once the mice have recovered, we collect the lungs, which are the primary site of the infection, as well as the draining lung lymph node, which is known as the uh, mediastinal lymph node, and also the spleen. So first off, to look at these cytotoxic T cells. So we noticed that there was no difference in the recruitment of CD8 T cells that were coming from wild-type cells or A1 knockout cells in any of the infected mice. But we can further look at antigen-specific T cells using tetramer staining. And you can see that, again, the contribution of antigen-specific cytotoxic T cells that were either wild-type or A1 knockout was the same. So there's no competitive disadvantage here. So then we looked at the CD4 helper T cells. So again, the Th1 cells are most important for um, activating the CD8 T cells, and the T follicular helper cells are involved in setting up the germinal center. We can look at Th1 cells by staining for CXCR3, and T follicular helper cells by looking at PD1 and CXCR5. But as you can see here, again, there was no significant difference between these two, the contribution of wild type and A1 knockout cells for either of these cell types. So finally, we looked at the germinal center response. So as I mentioned before, this is responsible for the production of antigen-specific secreting plasma cells and also memory B cells. So we can look at plasma cells by the expression of Syndican 1, and germinal center B cells are B220 positive, but also express FAS and GL7. And though we saw a slight decrease in the germinal center B cells, there was no difference in the contribution of wild-type or A1 knockout plasma cells, which suggests that the whole B cell response is normal as well. So what is the role of A1 in the immune response? Well, it's clear that the A1 knockout mice respond normally to this flu infection. And we've also um, explored a chronic viral infection in the form of LCMV and done a T-dependent immunization as well. So we've really thoroughly looked thoroughly looked at T cell responses in these mice. And again, you can read more about this here if you're interested. More recently, I've been doing some work with some um, different pathogens, so the bacteria Citrobacter rodentium and also the parasite Toxoplasma gondii, and we're yet to strike gold with these mice. So the obvious question then is why does A1 have no phenotype, and it's probably because of the expression of these other pro-survival proteins. So whilst I showed you that A1 is massively upregulated in response to um, stimulation in T cells and B cells, you can also see that BCLX cell is also upregulated, and in fact, BCL2 and MCL1 are still present at appreciable levels as well. So then we decided to generate compound mutant mice to see if we could pull apart which of these proteins shares the most role with A1 in different cell types. So for this purpose, we generated 
the heterozygous A1 knockout mice, remembering that we can't generate the knockout mice because of the severe phenotypes that happen in them. So to summarize a lot of work rather quickly, again, we didn't see any major differences, but there was this one thing in the BCLX heterozygous A1 knockout mice in that they had significantly reduced spleen T cell numbers, both in the CD4 and CD8 lineages. And we also saw this when we looked at the um, activation phenotype of these T cells. So looking at the CD8 T cells, again, we saw a significant reduction in the naive, central, and effector memory populations. And this was the same in the CD4 T cells. So we thought, OK, great. Maybe these two proteins are working together to maintain T cell survival after activation. So we did the same thing we did before, which is the in vitro activation assay. So instead of looking at proliferation this time, we're just looking at apoptosis. And you can see that unstimulated cells die over time, whereas if you stimulate them with anti-CD3 and anti-CD28, their survival is improved for a short amount of time. But again, there were no differences between any of these genotypes. So to, con to summarize that work, um, these three different compound mutant mice are also very normal so far. Um, we saw some minor differences in these CD4 T cell populations, but no survival defect in vitro. And it could just be that this heterozyg heterozygosity is not enough of a decrease in these protein levels. And a better way to explore this could be with conditional knockout models. So you can have tissue-specific deletion of BCL2 or BCLX or MCL1 at the same time as having A1 deletion. But another point is that perhaps it's just several pro-survival proteins maintain the survival of different cell types, which would make sense, like, to have backup for... I mean, if you just relied on one pro-survival protein, it could be disastrous to lose it. So um, this has recently been shown in a paper from Emma Carrington, whereby CDCs and also T cells from A1 knockout and MCL1 heterozygous, so again, these compound mutant mice, are more sensitive to the BCL2 inhibitor ABT199, as you can see in the triangles here. So it's likely that there's layers of these pro-survival proteins that are important for the survival of different cell types. And importantly, uh, it's nice to see as well that it's different between the different cell types because B cells do not rely as much on A1. So you could be wondering, after all this negative data that I've just shown you, is this the end for A1, doomed to be forever the flightless bird while it looks on at its siblings, BCL2 and MCL1? Um, and this is where I'd like to change tack a little bit with my talk and, I guess, highlight the importance of going back and reading the literature every now and then. It's not something that we PhD students always do. Um, but this is a paper that I found that basically changed the way I thought about my project um, and, yeah, led to a new direction. So this paper was about neutrophils, which I've mentioned before, but I didn't really go into detail about what they are and what they do. So um, by way of introduction, neutrophils are one of these granulocyte cells, and their main job is to patrol in the bloodstream, looking for any potential pathogens. Um, without any activation, they die relatively quickly, so the average neutrophil will be dead within 8 to 20 hours in humans. However, upon some sort of inflammation, these neutrophils are recruited to sites um, led by these chemotactic signals, and in this process, their lifespan is actually extended, and this enables them to deal with the um, pathogen at hand. Uh, so they're a phagocytic cell type, and they typically engulf the bacteria and kill them. So the regulation of neutrophil lifespan is really, really important. And this is shown by these just two examples. Um, so if you don't have enough neutrophils or they're dying too much, you have a condition known as neutropenia. And this means that you're more susceptible to infection, which highlights the importance of these neutrophils in host defense. But on the flip side, if you have too many neutrophils and they're not dying enough, you can get chronic inflammatory diseases, such as this um, rheumatoid arthritis. So it's really important that neutrophil lifespan is regulated. So I mentioned before that the lifespan is extended in order to deal with the invading pathogen, but it's really important that these activated neutrophils are then removed once they've done their job. And there's a couple of ways that this can happen. So the first of which is just phagocytosis-induced cell death. Neutrophils know once they've engulfed a bacteria that their job is done and they need to die. 
But another mechanism, in case this doesn't happen, is death receptor-induced cell death. So this is mediated by cytotoxic T cells that present death ligands um, to neutrophils expressing death receptors on their cell surface. A third way is cytokine withdrawal. So as the inflammation is resolved, you lose these chemotactic signals, and neutrophils are very sensitive to dying without this constant stimulation. So I'm going to focus now on this death receptor-induced cell death pathway, because this paper showed that neutrophils are exquisitely sensitive to fast ligand-induced death. So fast ligand is one of these death ligands. And as you can see, over time, as these neutrophils are treated with fast ligand, they become they are um, dying over time. And they showed that this fast-induced apoptosis was important for the clearance of neutrophils in a couple of different infection models. So I didn't show the full pathway of this before, but um, essentially the net result is the same as with intrinsic apoptosis in that you get the activation of these caspases and they mediate the destruction of the cell. The difference is that it's mediated from outside of the cell, so binding of a death ligand to its death receptor, and this allows the formation of this death-inducing signaling complex. This allows the activation of caspase 8, which activates these caspases. Importantly, there's a link between these two pathways, and that link is the bh 3 only protein known as BID. So caspase 8, once it's active, has BID as one of its substrates, and when BID is cleaved, it becomes T-BID, which is the active form. TBID then interacts with certain pro-survival BCL2 family proteins, and this is a way of amplifying that apoptotic response, so by having death mediated extrinsically as well as intrinsically. So what this paper showed is neutrophils were sensitive to this fast ligand-induced death, but also that this could be delayed by uh, stimulating factors. So for example, LPS, which is this bacterial component, and also pro pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-18, and GMCSF. And they propose that this is important to enhance neutrophil-mediated clearance of pathogens, but what really bugged me is that they didn't identify the downstream mediators of this survival. So they just said, yep, um, LPS, GMCSF, survival, we don't know why. So it got me thinking about A1, because I showed you before that A1 is massively upregulated by LPS and GMCSF. So it led to this question that perhaps what's happening here is you have the survival signal, which is perhaps via A1, at the same time as this death signal. And importantly, because um, there's this crossover between the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways, uh, A1 seemed like a plausible candidate, oh, which I've highlighted there. So. Um, uh, for this experiment, I isolate neutrophils from the bone marrow, and this is just showing how they die in culture over time, which is actually what I've already shown you previously. And so you can see that by four days, all your neutrophils are dead, and there's no difference between the wild type and the A1 knockout. If you treat them with LPS and GMCSF, their survival is greatly increased. So they are now alive up to seven days and probably much longer, and there's no major difference between the wild type and the A1 knockout neutrophils. When we treat with fast ligand, apoptosis is rapidly induced. So here, where at 48 hours they used to be about 50% viable, they're now only about 20% viable. And again, no difference in the rate of apoptosis between wild type and A1 knockout cells. When you treat with the combination of fast LPS and GMCSF, as you can see, survival is extended, which is exactly the same as they showed in this paper. And then what gets exciting is when you put the A1 knockout on there as well. So finally, we can see that there's a difference between the wild type and the A1 knockout, and it's something to do with the combination of this signaling pathway and also this signaling pathway. So our rough model for this at the moment is that GMCSF and LPS upregulate A1 probably via NF-kappa B, as A1 is an NF-kappa B target gene. At the same time, you have this fast signal coming through trying to kill the cell, but A1 is able to slow it down. <laughs> so um, just to round that off, I guess, uh, they say Kiwis can't fly, um, but perhaps if you do a little bit of reading, you can build yourself a plane and get up in the air anyways. 
But at this stage, we've only really built the plane, and that's something that's important to bear in mind. So I've shown that A1 is important for protecting neutrophils from this fast ligand-induced apoptosis, at least in vitro. So the question is, what's next? Is A1, is this actually relevant to any particular um, neutrophil or bacterial-driven pathologies? And it's actually interesting to note that A1 has been uh, described to be upregulated or stabilized um, in neutrophils that have been infected with a couple of different pathogens. So um, it's well known that pathogens can sometimes try and manipulate the host response to better um, enhance their own survival, and perhaps this is occurring via A1 in some instances. We're also interested in looking at this particular bacterium, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a common cause of pneumonia and sepsis in cystic fibrosis patients, but also people who are immunocompromised. And uh, more interestingly, it's one of the most multi-drug resistant bacteria out there. So there's a desperate need for new treatment strategies. We know that neutrophils contribute to chronic inflammation in cystic fibrosis, and we also know from several studies that the clearance of the pathogen is dependent on fast ligand, so this might be a good model for us to pursue with. Um, and also, finally, I wanted to mention a, a different plane that I didn't really get to talk about at all yet, and that is that A1 is overexpressed in lots of types of human cancer. So on the left side, you can see um, a lot of leukemias and lymphomas, but also some solid tumors, including stomach cancer, breast cancer, and melanoma. What's even more interesting is that there's an association of A1 with chemotherapy-resistant and also metastatic tumors. So perhaps A1 is a, um, a novel therapeutic target for these cancers. But not just that, the A1 knockout mice are really normal. So if you had an A1 inhibitor, you would imagine that there would be, it would be really well tolerated. Um, unlike a lot of chemotherapies that are out there. So as I said, this is just a plane at the moment. But we already have some promising data. So this is work performed by Mark Mensink, who um, was a master's student in Suzanne Corey's lab, supervised by Cass Vandenberg. And they showed that deletion of A1 in established emu mic lymphomas was able to extend survival of these mice. And this is using conditional deletion of A1 using a Cree-ERT2 model. This is also something that I did a while back, looking in diffuse large B-cell lymphomas that were provided to me by Dimi Zotos in Axel Kelly's lab. And you can see that there's massive expression of A1 in some of these tumors compared to normal wild-type spleen. This is also interesting because this is a type of lymphoma that has a poor response to ABT199, which is the BCL2 inhibitor. And lastly, A1 has been reported by several papers now to be um, promoting the survival of melanoma, and this is something that I'm currently working on. So, like I said, at the moment, we've sort of just built the plane, but watch this space, because who knows, maybe an A1 inhibitor will be the next finidoclax. Um, so with that, I'd just, like, <laughs> I'd just like to finish by thanking Marco and Andreas, my incredible supervisors. Um, as you can tell, they don't like to take themselves too seriously, which I think is really valuable, um, especially when I take things way too seriously. Uh, so thank you so much for your mentorship and help throughout the past three years. Um, and also thank you to the MGC division, also, who don't like to take things too seriously. So before I had my papers published, I considered this the greatest achievement of my PhD, that I managed to get everyone to dress up like Marco, which is there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you guys are a great division to be in, and um, yeah, I'm going to miss you guys when I leave this place. And lastly, um, I've made a massive acknowledgement slide. Of, I've tried to fit in everybody that I've ever worked with, and I'm pretty sure I would have forgotten someone, so I'm really sorry if you're not on here. Um, but starting off with my animal technicians, firstly, Hannah Johnson, Crystal Hughes, Cass, who's now left us, and Dan, our new mouse tech, who's doing a really great job. I have worked with so many mice, and they've all been looked after by these guys. So um, obviously, none of this can happen without them. And yeah, thank you so, so much. Obviously, I've done a lot of facts as well. Simon helped a lot with early woes with that, and um, also his team for doing the, running the sorters. Every blood analysis, analysis that I've ever done has been performed by either Jason or Jasmine. Um, I thought I'd thank the Media Kitchen for all my tissue culture experiments as well. They do a lot for us that I think get overlooked. Um, shipping as well, you deliver all my reagents. Um, 
and also education. I did a bit of a mentoring internship with Keely Bumstead O'Brien and Sue also make sure that I send my um, progress reports in on time. And then moving on to people on our floor, Herald Lab, every Monday meeting for listening to me go on about my project and troubleshooting and uh, giving ideas. Uh, within the Strasser Lab, I've just selected a few of you who've helped me out with reagents in the past, Gemma, Lorraine, and Anne. Genotyping, a lot of it has been performed by Bruno, Karen, and Steph. Uh, cancer and hematology, Django's provided me with the GMCSF for that critical experiment, and I also believe that he purified the FAS ligand. And then in terms of all the other divisions, these are people that I've worked with, mostly with all these different crazy infection models that I've been doing. So Simon Preston for LCMV, uh, Michael Stutz actually lent me a caspase 8 antibody, Michael Coffey for the toxoplasma, immunology division, Emma and Yifan have been really great working with the dendritic cells, Sue Heinzel did a T-cell assay for me, Ajit we did the flu model with, um, Axel and Dimi, B-cell work as well. Jay more recently has been helping me with my melanoma work, and same with Fernando, and also Cyril has helped with my um, Citrobacter experiments. <laughs> Inflammation, Kate is your girl if you want to talk about neutrophils. Um, definitely owe her a big thank you for all her help. And then over at the Doherty Institute, Jacqueline Pearson has been helping me with the Citrobacter model as well, and I've just listed a few other people um, who've given me access to the Doherty because I don't actually have it. Um, and then, last but not least, of course, my PhD committee, Daniel, Jerry, and Ben, thank you for coming along. Listening to me talk every year, giving your advice and feedback along the way. Um, obviously, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that Leukemia Foundation money, which Marco mentioned before. Um, and also, I thought it might be good to mention that some of that money actually paid for a trip to Croatia, so it was a good, good investment. <laughs> uh, WISA, of course, providing monthly drinks and other festivities um, every week classic curry for feeding me on a Wednesday night, and which also leads nicely into my family and friends who I would definitely not be able to get through this without. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and leave you to grill me with questions. Thanks, Robin. That was a great talk. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions. Um, so... I know that you were you were quite skilled when you finally found something wrong with the triple knockout mice. Triple or just the A one knockout a with the A. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Triple knockout mice. Yes. So true. This, this uh, genome, these genome duplication events um, have been a long time ago, and usually genes that are not needed are lost, like the two gene in the middle. Mm. Um, so we've got several examples of that, the four Hux clusters, for example. Many of those genes have been retained because yeah. they are necessary. And evolution or selection is pretty ruthless. So the fact that there are three A1 genes means that each of them has a function. And I know that you can't possibly uh, tell us what the functions are, but I was wondering whether you have thought about Yeah. So it's interesting, uh, the 3A1, or the, the gene duplication of A1, is unique to mice. So you don't even see it in rats, you don't see it in any other mammal. Um, and the reasons for that aren't entirely clear. So uh, early expression studies have shown like fluctuating levels of the different isoforms in different cell types, so maybe there are specific roles for them, but it's pretty difficult to tease apart. And yeah, if we're not entirely sure why this has happened only in mice. So are they only in mice, or are they only retained in mice? That would be because, oh, yeah. because the genome duplications are general, mm. and then it's contracted again by a loss because the genes are not needed. Yeah. So of some of them we have four, and then others we have two. And yeah. Yeah, I guess that's a fair point. I didn't also mention that these isoforms are really highly similar to each other, like 97% on the DNA and amino acid sequence level as well. So if there are subtle differences between them, I guess maybe that's something that hasn't been explored well enough. But yeah, it's a great question. Given that the only remote event type you saw had to do with neutrophils and GMCSF stimulation, both of which are essential for mouse models of rheumatoid arthritis, about yes. Yes. Yeah, so Kate has performed the um, 
antibody-induced uh, the KB by N model with our mice, and we didn't see any differences between the wild type and the A1 knockout. But we do want to actually repeat that because there was a, a little bit of fluctuation in terms of the response between the individual mice. So yeah, it's definitely something we're thinking about. Yeah? With the T salt interaction phase in the select model, usually that's mass mediated. So have you mm -hmm. looked at kinetic to see whether you see a difference in your A1 knockout versus a wild type following? That yeah, we haven't. At the time, we were just looking at that one time point, and then this fast stuff came so much later. And it's certainly interesting, um, like also with the neutrophils, their clearance in the LCMV model in the peripheral organs. So in that paper that I read, they showed that fast was important for the clearance of these neutrophils there. We didn't actually look at those time points. So it's quite possible that we've missed stuff um, that we should have maybe looked at before. Does that make sense? Yeah. But no, we haven't is the short answer. Charlie. Um, so in the past work of Ken Shortman and Jose they got to show that um, when you take them in culture, they spontaneously activate. So Neutrophils? The dendritic cells. Oh, the dendritic cells, yeah. Yeah, so the in vitro model could be a model of DC activation uh, in that you're not getting full of survival. <coughs> yeah. In vivo, that's particularly important in that at the time of activation, you have this persistent antigen presentation long term. Yeah. Um, did you consider or have you considered looking at whether it's affecting how long DCs can present antigen for after infection? So maybe not infection clearance because there's multiple immune cells. Yeah. That could be redundant for that, but the capacity for antigen. Uh, so the short answer is no, we haven't done that. Um, and it's something that we sort of kept in mind as well with all the infection models, that if there was a DC defect, then, yeah, presumably there'd be something happening with the antigen presentation. But we were considering it more from the beginning of the infection. Um, I will say that the CDCs are supposed to be very important in Citrobacter infection, and we did specifically look at <coughs> CDC numbers in the gut after Citrobacter, and we didn't see any differences there. So... Uh, my hunch is that it's just like layers of um, redundancy, I guess, to make sure that the infection is dealt with. Yeah. No? All right. You mentioned um, A1 and some NFP targeting. Do you have any idea which NFP targeting is? Uh, CREL, I think. Definitely one of the REL ones as a uh, target <laughs> sequence. Oh, do they? Oh, crap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess then maybe not. I have to, uh, I can find it out though, yeah. Jay. Scary? Very nice talk, Ruben. <coughs> which, <coughs> which of the uh, cancers do you believe the data looks most impressive for? My, if I had to pick one that I would want to work on, it would be diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, and that's not just because it's resistant to ABT199, but also because A1 being constantly, well, being involved in the germinal center, perhaps, where you have these B cells that are constantly being activated and constant expression of A1. And there's also um, interesting things to do with EBV infected cells that express this LMP1, so they have this tonic BCR type signal and A1 expression being downstream of that. So, yeah, either EBV. B lymphomas or diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I'd put my money on. So. Hey. Nice talk, Robin. Um, I'm still confused about the results of the A1A knockout mice and why, why they aren't what, uh, and what, you know, why you couldn't find that in the true knockout. Do you think that is, what, do you have an explanation? <coughs> um, so, Andreas's explanation is that we're better. Um, <laughs> But no, the actual explanation... But they saw something, so do you think yeah. they knocked out more than the A1A? So I think it's more likely just genetic differences. So they were on different mouse backgrounds to us. Oh, what was it? Oh, I can't <coughs> recall off the top of my head, but it was definitely A1A was on a mixed background. Yeah. Yeah, John? John? So you've got this randomized uh, protection against the first <coughs> step, and you're saying that link is through the... I mean, it's pretty clear that it's likely to be yeah. it, but did you actually look to see whether it was clear? And as a secondary question, does that does the binary profile of bit really suggest that A1 is yes. the, the major target? Yeah, so A1 definitely binds to bit. Um, is uh, it the best binder? Or? Oh, gosh, I can't. 
tell you that off the top of my head. Um, but to go back to... Uh, Sorry, what? Cleavage. Bid cleavage. Oh, yeah. So I've been trying to do Western blots. I've had nightmare working with neutrophils, and I finally got it working. Um, but I'm struggling to see that lower T bid cleavage. And I'm, if you have any advice or anyone in your lab on how to actually see that, that would be great. And then the second thing that we're doing as well is we're breeding A1 knockout bid knockout mice. So presumably, if they respond, um, then it's the same pathway. Yeah. Any further questions? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mike. Um, just following up a little bit about John's question. So with the specificity for, of A1 for other prosopagal proteins, it's pretty similar, but we really similar to MC1. Yeah. When I mean, you haven't seen any effect with the crossing into the heads, MC1 heads, do you think there was just still enough MC1 there? Because it might just be a backup for MC1. And have you tested the MC1 individual in the A1 knockout mice if it has a more severe I'm so glad you asked that question, but I don't have the slide to show it. So in all of these neutrophil assays, I've been looking at MCL1 HET A1 knockouts as well. And this is what's really in oh, and also with the MCL1 inhibitor. So what's really interesting is if you treat wild-type neutrophils with FAS, LPS, GM, and the MCL1 inhibitor, they're exactly the same as wild-type cells. And the A1 knockout cells, how they die over time, it's unaffected by the MCL1 inhibitor as well. And then with the MCL1 HET A1 knockout mice, it's slightly lower than the A1 knockout, so there probably is some sort of like additive effect of those two proteins. Um, but the MCL1 HET mice on their own, same as wild type. So it really seems to be something to do with A1. And so perhaps looking back into that A1 bid interaction would be worthwhile. Okay. With that, spot on time. Talk <laughs> Thanks, Robert.